Are you sure about this? I asked Sean for what seemed like the tenth time in the last two hours we'd been hiking the overgrown trail. The sun was high overhead, filtering through the shady canopy and flares of light as the trees moved with the blowing of the cool breeze. For a late March afternoon, the weather was nearly perfect. Crisp and clear, but still warm enough that we'd been able to stow our heavier jackets and trade them out for light windbreakers. We've been walking for a while, and haven't seen anything yet. Sean paused a moment ahead of me, scratching idly at his leg while he checked the GPS. Yeah, almost there. Just a little further, he said with a knowing grin. He knew that I hadn't been as keen as he was about going off-plan for his little side excursion. But I also knew that there was no way I was going to be able to dissuade him. He had that same look in his eyes that he always got when he'd set his mind to something. I took a bearing when I saw it, and we've been staying on course. Shouldn't be much longer. We've been going uphill for a while now, and the trees are starting to thin a bit. We should be close. We've been hiking through Glacier National Park on our annual outing, a tradition we'd kept every year since we left college and went our separate ways. In that time, I married and started a family, and Sean continued the whole bohemian wonderlust thing that he'd been drawn toward for as long as we'd known each other. Every month or two, he'd send me a postcard from some new exotic location he'd visited, and I'd be keeping tabs on his ventures via his social media posts. Two months prior, he'd hiked through Nepal and visited Everest Base Camp, while I stood in a cramped conference center amidst an insipid sea of other boring, monochrome colleagues as yet another in an endless line of pointless trade shows. Our connection was slowly but surely fading, though, as he spent his days drifting from place to place, picking up whatever odd jobs he could to supplement his income. I was focused on my family, and the white-collar career that I'd built to provide for them. Aside from our yearly gathering, and the few sporadic phone calls scattered throughout the holidays, we were slowly drifting apart. It was sad to think about losing that connection with someone who'd been your best friend since elementary school. Uh, But I supposed it was inevitable. Just the way of things. Because of this, I was always more tolerant of Sean's flights of fancy when we were together, despite the fact that they often ran in opposition with my own more conservative inclinations. So when we'd been hiking atop the ridgeline earlier that morning, and Sean suddenly stopped and pointed out the odd structure protruding from the trees on the hill opposite us, I hadn't offered much resistance. It was difficult to tell without binoculars from that distance, but Sean was insistent that it looked like an old fire lookout tower. I was less certain, but my eyesight wasn't as good as his, and it definitely seemed like the right shape. We weren't in fire season, and as I understood it, the towers weren't manned during this time of the year. Hell, I'd even read that some states would rent them out to people as unique weekend vacation rentals. I always thought that sounded like an interesting idea, and had even floated it past Cheryl a couple of times as a romantic getaway concept, knowing full well that there was little chance she'd be interested in the idea. She was more of a weekend at the cottage, on the beach kind of woman, and never took much of a shine to the idea, so I'd given up on it. Admittedly, my interest was piqued when Sean drew my attention to the tower, and even more so when he spied what looked like an old dirt path that wandered through the shallow and forested basin, separating us from it. It hadn't taken much convincing to get me to follow along behind him as well, as we left the main trail and started winding descent. Truth be told, I was enjoying this little adventure, enjoying the feeling of rebelling against my routine-oriented instincts. When we were abruptly stopped by the chain-link fence that stretched forebodingly across the trail, that little voice in the back of my head was chanting a very distinct, 
I told you so mantra. Old and worn, no trespassing signs were prominently displayed along the fence line every 30 or 40 feet. The paint faded and illegible in places. You could just make out the official seal of some government office, but it was impossible to identify which. I supposed it was probably the Park Service or something like that. Huh, said Sean, hands on his hips as we stood before the eight-foot-tall fence, topped with barbed wire. That's weird. Why would anybody go through all the trouble of putting up a fence here? I moved to stand next to him, noting how the fence ran to our right and our left, lost quickly from sight to the dense trees that surrounded the narrow trail. Eh, They probably don't want anybody trespassing on the tower, I offered, wondering myself at the unexpected placement of the barrier. Eh, that doesn't make any sense, he said with an absent shake of his head, not taking his eyes off the fence. Just put one around the base of the tower. I've seen those before. This looks like the whole area is cordoned off. I stood there another moment, silently agreeing with his assertion. It was a mystery, but not one I was overly interested in getting to the bottom of. Finally, with a quick glance to the sunlight filtering through the trees above, I gave him a quick slap on the shoulder and nodded back the way we'd come. Regardless, we'd better turn around if we want to make it back to the campsite before dawn. I don't want to be setting up our tents in the dark. Sean turned an amused smile to me, and I could see the sparkle of mischief in his eyes, reminding me so much of that little kid who used to always get me in trouble when we were younger. You're joking, right? It's just a chain-link fence, Jim. I'm not climbing over that thing, I said, shaking my head with a frown. The last thing we need is for one of us to break an ankle or get cut up on the barbed wire. Nobody even knows where we are. We should be two hours further along the trail by now, not bushwhacking our way up to another ridge entirely. He looked back at the fence thoughtfully, moving forward and leaning his weight against the galvanized steel mesh. There was a good amount of give to it, and after a moment's consideration, he reached down and grasped the bottom edge, pulling it up from the ground. I saw there was easily enough room for a grown man to army crawl beneath it, and groaned inwardly at what I knew was coming next. Come on, Jim. Get your butt under there and hold it for me. We're almost there. There's no sense turning back now. He goaded with that same mischievous grin. I gave a resigned sigh, unslung my backpack from my shoulders, and shoved it under the fence following behind it on the hard-packed trail, and grimacing at the stones that dug into my elbows and chest as I went. When I reached the other side, I held the mesh up for my friend, and a few moments later we both stood on the inside, re-securing our backpacks. Sean nodded past me, and I turned to look at the path that continued up the gentle incline. Through the breaks in the trees ahead, I could just make out the straight lines of a man-made structure. Without another word, we struck off again. Sean in the lead and I following along behind, adjusting my heavy backpack as I went. The air, though still cool and breezy, now seemed to have an odd feeling to it, as if something had changed slightly with our trespassing. The sounds of the forest somehow subdued, and the sunlight didn't feel quite as penetrating or warm as it made its way through the canopy overhead. As we walked, I wondered if we were going to have to backtrack all the way back to the main trail in order to make for the campsite we'd registered with the ranger station, or if there was perhaps a shortcut we could take from here that would still allow us to reach the site before we lost the light of the day. Ten minutes later, we emerged from the tree line into a wide and heavily overgrown clearing, underbrush, tall grass, and vines choking the ground as we proceeded threatening to trip us up with each step. In the center of the clearing stood the subject of our quest, the lookout tower. Rising 80 feet or more above the ground, the timber-framed tower looked old and disused, covered in a blanket of creeper vines, 
and green-gray moss that rose halfway up its height. At the top sat a window-lined shack surrounded by a narrow walkway with wooden rails that appeared questionable in their integrity, at least from this distance. A metal staircase wound its way around and up the structure, rising higher and higher, and ending in what appeared to be a trap door in the catwalk far above. At the base of the tower stood a small cabin, not much larger than the shack that was perched atop the aging structure. A slack electric line swayed loosely in the breeze, running from the tower to what I assumed was a generator, housed in a small shed behind the cabin. The cabin's door was closed and locked from the outside by a rusty padlock, securing an equally rusty latch. Though it looked like the hardware had been indifferently affixed to the frame and door with cheap wood screws, and the shackle appeared to be barely hanging on to the wood frame. The windows of the cabin, all still intact, were grimy and coated with a layer of greenish mold, giving the strange appearance of some otherworldly frost that had beset them. The roof and walls of the cabin were covered in that same green, lush creeper vine that rose partway up the tower, and the whole area gave me the sense that this location had been abandoned for many years. Despite my initial misgivings, I couldn't deny the sense of adventure and discovery I now felt, as if we were some early 20th century explorers, and we just discovered an ancient, treasure-filled temple buried in the heart of the Amazon. I grinned as the theme from Raiders floated through my thoughts. Sean gave a hoot of surprise, and I walked over to where he stood looking at an old jeep that had been parked next to the cabin and left to the ravages of nature as it slowly reclaimed the whole area. Man, I can't believe they just left this here, he said, trying to get a good look at the vehicle. The rusted metal and flat tires made it look like it had been here for 50 years or more, but I recognized the body style as one of the newer generations. I estimated that it couldn't have been more than 5 or 10 years old at the most. Huh. I guess leaving a vehicle out here to the elements really does a number on it before too long, I said, trying to get a look in through the mold-frosted windshield. Unfortunately, all I could make out were the shadowed silhouettes of the seats within. Too bad, it was probably pretty nice when it was in good shape. Yeah, he said, lost in his own observations of the thing. Uh, I guess it must have broken down and they didn't figure it was worth to have it pulled out of here. He took out his phone and took pictures of the whole area, no doubt planning to upload them to his popular vlog where he documented his adventures, allowing others to live vicariously through them. He lowered his phone and pressed a few keys, frowning. Man, service out here really sucks. Been up and down all day, you'd think we would have a pretty good standing on top of a mountain. I chuckled, pulling my attention away from the jeep and turning it to the lookout tower looming above us. It seemed insanely tall from this position, but it occurred to me that I had no idea exactly how tall most of them were. It's possible that this one was perfectly average. The wooden structure looked surprisingly intact as it rose high above me, and I marveled at what a pain it must have been to build out here in such a remote location. The creeper vines covered most of it, intermixed with that stringy moss that gave it a furry appearance. I could see that the moss and vines had reached the walkway at the top, and the moss hung over the border like the frayed edges of an old tablecloth. Again, I wondered idly how long this thing had sat derelict, forgotten by the agency that had built and manned it. It was almost sad, in a way. It was likely this tower and the cabin nearby had been the home of the rangers stationed here for quite a bit. At one point, the whole clearing would have been neatly cut back and maintained, and the tower and cabin kept clear of the encroaching vegetation. It was equally likely that the cabin had also served as a sort of substation for the rangers, where hikers and campers would pass through sometimes and check in or ask for directions. Now it sat silently, forgotten and left to die in the sea of trees, 
long abandoned by those who had built it and kept it company. A wave of motion swept through the creepers above me, a breeze too high for me to feel, sending the ivy-like leaves and moving patterns very reminiscent of ocean waves. The hollow echo of boots on metal drew my attention. I looked to see Sean mounting the blanketed staircase. What are you doing? I asked. He just grinned and waved me over. Come on, Jim, let's take a look upstairs. It's got to be a hell of a view. Before I could protest, he was climbing the steel tread stairs, hand lightly gliding atop the tubular railing as he went. With a last long look around the clearing, I surrendered to my friend's enthusiasm and followed him up the stairs that ascended the tower in a squared spiral. Although the voice in the back of my mind warned of the obvious dangers of decayed timber and rusted metal, it was quickly overridden. As I rose above the ground, my footfalls a muted ringing that seemed too loud and quiet that had at some point settled over the forest around us. Up and up I climbed, the forest floor falling away below me as we approached the soaring canopy of the old trees. Looking down, I paused a moment, marveling at how small the ranger station seemed now, roughly centered in the broad clearing. I could see the vine-covered jeep on the side of the small building and the generator shack behind it. Turning away, I watched as Sean disappeared around the corner above and ahead of me, continuing his climb. I followed, quickening my pace to join my friend. We broke free of the treetops a few flights before we reached the catwalk of the lookout shack, and I had to stop again and stand in awe of the view that stretched out in all directions around us. The forest that covered the hills and valleys seemed almost like we were in the middle of some great green sea, surrounded by the frozen crests and troughs of its immense swells. A cool wind found us now and tugged at my hair and nylon windbreaker, trying to chase away the sudden warmth of the midday sunlight that now had an unobstructed path to us. I looked downward, my eyes following the lines of the tower structure as it dropped away through the trees and into the heavily shadowed forest below. Even though we had only just been there, I felt distant somehow, slightly unsettling and much darker than it had seemed previously. Now that we stood in the afternoon sun, the clearing below was a sharp contrast, lush and alive, but also hidden in some way and secretive. Jim, up here, called Sean, and I quickly jogged up the last few flights of stairs to join him on top of the tower catwalk, where he had dropped his pack and now leaned against the waist-high wooden railing that bordered it. He was lost in the moment the sun shining on his face as he gazed with childlike wonder at the vista stretching out before us. A fleeting moment of unease almost caused me to chastise him for trusting his life with what was probably not the most reliable of structures. But I knew it wouldn't do any good, so instead I set my backpack down next to his against the wall of the shack and stood next to him. Man, it's an incredible view, he said. I just nodded. We stood there for another moment before he straightened and walked around the corner of the window-lined shack looking for the door. I followed, trying to peer through the glass as we went, but that same mold or mildew that we found on the cabin windows below also clouded these, obscuring any detail within. He found the door, and I was slightly surprised to find that the creeper vines and moss had managed to climb this high, out of the shadowed forest, and taken their hold even up here, though they seemed a little grayer and less insistent on their grasp, and I didn't think they fared very well in this direct sunlight. Even so, they had tangled in the door and Sean had to lean his weight into it and push hard to swing it inward, tearing and snapping the vines away as he did so. We stepped through the threshold into what felt like, almost like we were stepping into a greenhouse much of the interior walls and surfaces having surrendered to encroachment of the vegetation. Along one wall was a small cot, the mattress and sheets torn and decayed and stained green with mold. 
a small writing desk occupied the opposite wall, and a square wooden table stood sentry in the center of the room, covered in the deteriorated covered in the deteriorated remains of notebooks and loose pages. The air in the shack was strangely humid and close, and the heavy sense of nature filled my every breath, the calm serenity I often associated with it now oddly absent. The light of the afternoon sun struggled to penetrate the clouded windows, and instead cast a greenish tint to even those surfaces not already covered by vegetation. The corner of the room nearest the cot was a tangle of leaves and vines that formed a small mound, likely where the vines received the least amount of direct sunlight and allowed them to flourish. I became aware that I had been subconsciously holding my breath for a moment, still standing just inside the doorway, and felt a quiet warning at the back of my mind, an uncomfortable sensation that urged me to leave this tower and get back to the main trail. It was then that I realized how much time we'd spent in our unplanned exploration, and how the sun had continued its descent towards the western horizon. This early in the year, we probably only had a couple hours of good daylight left, and a quick mental calculation told me that it was unlikely we'd make it to our pre-arranged campsite before full dark even if we were fortunate enough to find some sort of shortcut from here. I cursed under my breath, aware that we'd likely be stumbling through the dark on the trail, and forced to find a suitable area to camp for the night. Okay, Sean, time to go, I said, stepping back out of the doorway and onto the catwalk. We need to get back to the trail, post-haste. As it is, we're going to be hiking in the dark for a bit. I walked around and picked up my pack, noting with mild surprise that some of the vines had already managed to attach themselves to it, clinging to the fabric as I pulled it away. I looked through the open trap door and the catwalk at the dizzying view to the ground below, the muted greens of the vines obscuring most of the steps and causing them to blend in to the background below, giving the disquieting illusion that they had somehow vanished, and I was staring at an 80-foot freefall. It was strange, but I could no longer clearly discern any of the metal steps through the blanket of creepers. Of course, with the light beginning to fade, most of the tower was cast in growing shadows, and I wrote it off as an optical illusion. Sean? I called back over my shoulder. When I didn't get a reply, I shook my head and ducked back into the doorway, finding my friend staring at the central table and leafing through a notebook he'd found. He looked up at my arrival and an unreadable expression on his face as he nodded at the handwritten pages. I uh, found a notebook left by the ranger. Check it out, it's strange though. Come on, Sean, take it with you and you can read it later. We need to get going, I said, not bothering to keep the frustration from edging in my tone. Hang on a second, Jim, he said, turning his attention back to the weathered pages. These pages are dated from October of last year. This thing is only five months old. Look, that can't be right. This is obviously just a mistake, I said, growing more impatient. This place has been abandoned for years. Let's go. Just a second, he snapped, and the insistence in his voice quelled my growing irritation. When I felt quiet, he started reading aloud. October 15th. After two days at my new posting, I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable out here. I can't really put my finger on it, but it feels like there's something here with me. It's like I'm never alone. No matter where I am or what I'm doing. Not sure what to make of it. The weirdest thing is the lack of animal life around here. It's like they avoid this area for some reason. It's damned eerie. October 16th. Spent all day cutting back the vines from the tower and station. I'm going to see if I can get some sort of herbicide to keep them in check. Last night the generator cut out and I discovered that the filter and carburetor were completely blocked up by the moss. It took me nearly an hour to clear them and get it running again. Nobody told me that most of my duties out here would be as a landscaper. I might have brought my floppy hat and gardening gloves with me. <laughs> October 18th. Not sure what's going on. I know I heard some weird rumors about this place before I accepted the posting. Though they all sound like BS to me. I'm not so sure. 
generator is down again, and I've decided to stay in the lookout tower tonight. Tomorrow I'll need to figure out my next move for sure, but I'm done here. I'm willing to find somebody else to man the station. What the hell is going on out here? Sean stopped reading and looked up at me, his face a mask of confusion in the slowly waning light of the afternoon. What else does it say? I asked, now very interested in the logbook for some reason. He looked up at me and shrugged. Nothing, that's his last entry. He must have booked it out of here the next day. Yeah, I said, but if this ranger was so gung-ho on getting out of here, why did he leave his jeep? You can't tell me he decided to just hike out of here. A disturbing thought struck me at that moment, and my eyes wandered hesitantly to the mound of vegetation in the corner of the room, which I now recognized to be unusually large and strangely formed, as if concealing something. You don't think... I said, my words trailing off. No way, Sean said slowly in disbelief, dropping the logbook to the table and moving cautiously to the shadowed corner near the cot, eyes fixed upon the mass of vines and ivy. Sean, I started to say, some unarticulated warning creeping into my tone, but I didn't know what else to say and the words died in my throat. He reached the mound and crouched carefully, tilting his head and peering intently into the green shadows, trying to discern any detail within. He looked back at me for a moment as if to reassure himself that I was still there, then cautiously reached his hand in to clear some of the vines for a better look. In that moment, I caught a glimpse of khaki peeking out through the leaves and of something bleach white encased within the cloth. Bones? I gasped sharply and took an involuntary step backwards, bumping into the table and knocking the logbook to the floor. Sean jerked his head around at the sudden sound and lost his balance, reaching out reflexively to steady himself. His hand sunk into the pile of vegetation and he gave it a sharp cry of pain. I saw then that the leaves of the vines had long, evil-looking thorns the length of my fingers and glistening shiny black in the dim light. He cursed and tried to jerk his hand free, but something held him in place. Ah, shit, that hurts! He hissed, struggling to free himself. With a sudden rustling movement, the vines constricted around his wrist tightly, the wire-like length snapping like a spring-loaded snare. Once his hand was trapped, they continued tightening until the flesh beneath them abruptly parted, opening as neatly as any razor blade. Sean howled in pain and fought frantically to disengage himself from the tangle, blood pumping from the terrible wound and staining his yellow windbreaker a nightmare tie-dye of crimson. Without another thought, I leapt forward and reached for his free hand to lend my strength to his own and help pull him free, but before I reached him, his struggles upset his balance once again, and this time he fell headlong into the writhing mass of green and red. In an instant, the vine surged over him, enveloping him down to his shoulders with a sickening hunger. I drew back in revulsion and fear, my mind not able to process what I was seeing. And that's when he started screaming. It was a horrific, blood-curdling shriek of raw terror and suffering as he lay face down in the pile of brutal thorns and vines that now covered his upper body, writhing and legs flailing wildly, oblivious to the awful lacerations he was suffering in the process. Blood now slicked the floorboards beneath him and his cries were muffled and distant. I could only stand there in mute shock, watching him helplessly as his struggles gradually began to slow and grow weaker. Not long after that, he fell silent and didn't move again. I don't know how long I stood there, unblinking, unmoving, unbelieving alone. I know that when I did finally gather my senses to turn and flee, I discovered to my horror that the vines had stealthily expanded across the doorway to the shack, blocking my only exit, my only escape. I sit here now atop the table in the center of the room, only a few feet away from what's left of my best friend. I've tried over and over again to get some sort of signal on my phone but the single bar that periodically appears is elusive and fleeting, never present long enough to make a call for help. 
I'm writing this post locally on my phone, hoping that it will automatically transmit when the signal returns. Those vines have covered the whole floor now, and I can see in the light of my cell phone that they've started climbing the legs of this table. If it were closer to dawn, I might have more hope. I think these things shrink from the sunlight, but dawn is six hours away, and the vines are getting closer. It won't be too much longer now. So today's Fire Lookout story was brought to you by Dark Knight Tales. They're the writer, author of today's story. They also have a YouTube channel where they do horror narrations. Uh, you can check out their channel on YouTube, Dark Knight Tales, with underscores between the words. And I'll link their, uh, their YouTube channel and their author profile in the description below. They're also a very talented writer on Reddit No Sleep. Uh, thanks for listening to today's story, everyone. Please like, subscribe, comment, and join me again next time for another creepy horror story narration at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks. Have a great night. By now, you've probably heard of the popular TV show that portrays the cordyceps fungus infecting humans and turning them into zombie-like creatures. But let me tell you, the real-life scenario is much more terrifying. I work in a lab that specializes in plant and fungi experimentation. Our primary focus is on developing new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, including everything from anti-aging remedies to creating the next little blue pill. However, we also received significant funding from the Defense Department, and their research requirements are much more sinister. How are the new test subjects going? Steve, our lab supervisor, asked as he approached me carrying a clipboard. He's gestured towards the eight test rooms in front of us. Number four looks promising, and I think six and seven are starting to show signs, I said, looking up from my workstation. Inside the eight test rooms were five men and two women, one in each room, plus a single empty room. It was left empty after a rogue chimpanzee from the earlier phase experiments had managed to escape its cage and break the pass-through window, which is used to transfer materials and instruments between sterile and non-sterile rooms. Stephen nodded, a look of excitement on his face. Excellent. We're getting closer. In the cages, test subject 1, 2, 3, and 5 appeared to be behaving somewhat normally, pacing their small 8x8 cage or talking to themselves. However, test subject 4 had remained motionless now for about two hours, lying on his side with his back to us, with his chest rising and falling, his only movements. Meanwhile, test subjects 6 and 7 had recently become lethargic, barely responding to the electric shocks administered to their enclosure. All of the test subjects had been exposed to a variety of chemically altered cordyceps fungus. Typically, cordyceps cannot infect humans due to our higher internal temperature, among other factors. However, by modifying the fungus's genetic makeup, we were close to changing that. Let's keep a close eye on those three. Report back to me if there are any updates. Will do, I replied. With that, Stephen left the room and I returned to monitoring the test subject's vitals on the screen. Interestingly, subjects 4, 6, and 7 had significantly elevated heart rates, almost 50% higher than the others. Additionally, their endorphin levels, the body's natural painkillers, were unusually high, indicating that they were experiencing intense pain despite showing none of the typical outward signs. What do you make of this? I asked my lab partner, Mike, while pointing to the screen with my pen. He looked over the vitals on my screen. It looks like they are in intense pain. Those sorts of levels would be what I would expect to see if someone were on fire, he said dryly. Yes, that's what it looks like to me as well. Our test subjects were some of the worst criminals our government had locked up. The advantage 
of working for the Defense Department, especially where we required human subjects, was there was no shortage of forgotten criminals. Terrorists, murderers, and other violent offenders. These individuals were typically housed in maximum security prisons and were serving lengthy life sentences often. While the use of human subjects in scientific experiments is controversial and subject to strict ethical guidelines, the Defense Department saw the need to conduct these tests outside the normal guidelines. Therefore, the rules no longer applied, and we had the green light to do whatever we needed to get the result. Let's do a blood test, see if the troponin levels have increased on subject 4, 6, and 7, I said to Mike. Mike nodded and left his seat to get dressed in his hazmat suit. With the heart rate and endorphin levels so extremely elevated, I thought it could be possible that the cordyceps is already spreading through the test subjects, paralyzing them while simultaneously causing immense pain. If my theory was right, then not only would we have successfully managed to infect the first ever human with cordyceps, but it would have taken effect within three hours of exposure. Cordyceps is a type of parasitic fungus that primarily infects ants, as well as other insects such as beetles and caterpillars. The infection process begins when a spore of the cordyceps fungus lands on the exoskeleton of an ant. Once the spore is attached to the ant, it begins to grow long, branching filaments that penetrate the ant's exoskeleton and start to invade its body. As the fungus grows, it releases chemicals that alter the ant's behavior, causing it to become disoriented and leave its colony. The fungus continues to grow inside the ant's body, eventually replacing its organs and tissues with a mass of fungal cells. We are not stupid. We know exactly why the Defense Department want to uh, essentially weaponize this. We do this because we are scientists, and pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and Further understanding the world around us is fundamental to our role. Now fully suited up, Mike entered the first test subject's room, number four, and activated the cage squeeze function. The cage started to close in on the test subject, squeezing in from front and back. This process meant Mike could get up and close to the test subject without risk to himself. But just as the cage closed in tight, locking the subject in place, his skin burst from multiple areas, and sharp, dagger-like spores fired out in all directions. Panicking, Mike turned and ran for the door he just came in through. I reached for the emergency lockdown button to prevent him from leaving and hit it a second too late. Mike ran out into the connecting corridor, screaming in pain. Some of the spores had penetrated his suit and were now drilling their way into his body as Mike screamed and clawed at the holes, ripping his hazmat suit while trying to get them out. I activated the alarms and locked down my door as Mike thrashed about in the corridor. A few minutes later, I heard security come running down the hall and yell at Mike to get down. But he was in too much pain to respond. The security guards continued to yell at Mike, tasers drawn, when Mike suddenly started running at them. Without flinching, both security guards tasered Mike, dropping him to the floor. They then slowly approached him to restrain him when suddenly Mike's body tore open and fired out more dagger-like spores. Impossible. I yelled at the camera as I watched both guards get hit by the spores. The cordyceps had multiplied and spread within minutes. The guards, now themselves in agonizing pain, ran back through the doors they'd come through him and into one of the main lab halls, where more than a dozen researchers were working. Watching through the cameras, I saw the researchers panicking and trying to escape by the now-locked doors, as the two security guards thrashed around. Then, just like Mike, the security guards' skin split open, firing multiple spores around the room. Most of the researchers had now been infected, and those that avoided being struck by the spores weren't so lucky a few minutes later as more spores went flying around the room. Soon every researcher was infected, screaming and writhing in agony. I stayed in my locked room for hours, watching as the infected slowly stopped moving. 
One by one, they collapsed to the floor or the tabletops, and I watched in horrified amazement as fungal growths started to grow from the holes in their skin. I eventually put on a hazard suit, unlocked the door, and left the office, slowly walking towards Mike's still body. By now, he was covered in fungal stalks and mushroom-like growths, and one had even gone right through his eye socket, popping his eyeball out to the side. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was his other eye, which was fixated on me. It had an expression of sheer terror and agony. He was alive, paralyzed, and appeared to be feeling every horrifying moment as the cordyceps slowly dissolved his internal organs and replaced them with fungal growths. I'm sorry, Mike, I whispered, genuinely upset at his predicament. Mike was a good guy, but I knew I couldn't help him. The cordyceps were devouring his internal organs as he lay there. So I did what any good scientist would do. I carefully took a sample of the growth from his eye socket and a blood sample. I then carefully attached a mobile heart rate monitor to his arm through one of the ripped holes Mike had made earlier and then slowly backed away into the secure room, locked the doors, and awaited my rescue. The data I could get from Mike would no doubt prove invaluable for our next attempt. So here I wait. It has taken longer than I thought to be rescued. It has now been about 60 hours since Mike got infected. The bodies are now unrecognizable lumps of fungal growths, and Mike's heart finally stopped registering a pulse about 15 hours ago, which means he was alive for two whole days after the infection. He did seem to have multiple heart attacks during that time, no doubt from the pain of different organs turning to slush, but somehow he was kept alive. I have tried the internal lines multiple times, but no one is answering. It's probably a security protocol I'm unaware of. And I can't see the cameras outside this part of the facility. But I'm sure they're just taking extreme precautions. After all, the last thing anyone would want is for this to escape the lab. But I'm sure everything is fine. At least, I hope it is. The emergency alert on my phone went off with a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily, just as I was bringing the last of my belongings into the cabin. I took the device from my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for at least a minute before the realization set in that I would have to leave, only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again, Severe weather alert. Heavy snowfall in the Frontenac region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck on the roads in the blizzard. Which subsequently meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, messages started coming in from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone and I opened it. Matt, did you see the emergency alert about the storm? I guess the trip's off. What a bunch of bullshit. Ted, OMFG. A generational storm is what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone for a few weeks. I hope you didn't go through with your plan to go up a day early, Jay. Greg. No kidding, what are the chances this blizzard hits on our ice fishing weekend? I messaged back saying I understood we'd have to reschedule. I told him I'd made the trip alone, accompanying the messages with forehead-slapping emojis. 
It sucks that I'll be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog Gibson pawed at my leg and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. I'm not completely alone. At least I've got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small black stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it, small bags containing kindling, which we brought with us in the summer and left behind. At first glance, it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience that I would need twice as much as it appeared to make it through the night. So I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There was no running water, no electricity, and the cabin was poorly insulated. Perennially procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in a slight trickle of cold air from outside. It was drafty and I could hear the sounds of mice, which made their way in through the gaps, burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into an old coat or a sleeping bag that someone had left behind. I sighed, lighting the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having mice in the cottage that set me on edge, but at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with a warm, flickering glow from a half-dozen kerosene lamps, I felt a little better. There was reassurance in having a fire, and I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm through the night. I loosely wadded up some newspaper, and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood until it was piled up to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight from several places, and watching as it began to burn, and then flared up in a bright, white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and warmed myself up. Eventually, I took off my boots and coat, the entire cottage gradually getting toasty. Uh, There's no sense unpacking, I thought, taking out a beer and opening it. I took a sip. Couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried this particular brand before and picked it up on a recommendation. It was terrible. And lukewarm to boot. Par for the course, considering the trip so far. I took out my phone and watched Netflix while the beer went flat inside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me, so that she was off the floor, and close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually, I got bored of office reruns and called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon ever closer to the stove so that it was as close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm, but not succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson, trembling on the bed beside me. I was so cold I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably, and I realized hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. I quickly put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking badly as well. My hands were trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling onto the fire, blowing into the embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen, my heart was beating fast, my skin prickling with pins and needles, turning into total numbness in my extremities. I'd never felt so cold in my life and realized it was far beyond the weather forecasted on the news. It seemed like it was minus 30 degrees and steadily dropping further. Terrified that I would not be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst-case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it would be 
impossible to light a fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside and I could get in there and start it up, turning on the heat until I felt warm again. But the idea of getting out there and the truck refusing to start was too much to take. And considering the state of the beat-up old Ford, that seemed like a distinct possibility in this cold. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often, until a tiny flame began to sputter and grow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gibson closer, we shared each other's warmth, and I began to feel half-human again. And then a sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump, my heart skipping a beat, then pounding faster and faster in my chest. A noise like long fingernails being dragged across the siding could be heard from all around, echoing in the small space. Something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons against the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me, and I put my hand over her muzzle, muffling her sounds. Was it a bear? I wondered and realized I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin, the spot beneath the bed where mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the wooden one behind that, which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden, as I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was breathing heavily just outside and trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook with the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out again at first as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone, and then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot, I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close, and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with weary eyes and taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up, at first I didn't notice it. It was dark in the cottage one minute, and then it was light. I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I would waste no more time before leaving. I just hoped the bear, or whatever, had been outside the night before was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me it was probably safe now. In the light of the morning, all that had happened seemed like a bad nightmare. I told myself maybe it had been. That was until I got outside and saw the claw marks which marred the exterior walls. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a shitty weekend this turned out to be, I thought to myself. With more people around, it was easier to keep the fire going, taking turns, feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter, and I never would again. There were too many things that could go wrong. A freak snowstorm, a fallen tree blocking the road getting stuck or going into a ditch, and those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things happened. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only a click and the absence of any engine noise. Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure I hadn't left an interior light on, or something which could have drained the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried once more. And finally, the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. Alright, Gibson. Let's get out of here. 
I said, rubbing the dog's head and smiling as she blinked her eyes. She looked content in the front seat, happy to be back in the truck and out of the old cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road and the tires got moving easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning gray above me and a few white flakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio and sure enough they said the same thing I was thinking. The snow would be arriving early. By noon, the highway would be a parking lot. Whiteout conditions, be prepared to be trapped in your car and have emergency supplies ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the hill. Hitting the gas, I came to the first big rise and went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive and brown, the lumpy, furry shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear, which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before, was dead, lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. At first I thought it was frozen to death. I got out of my truck to inspect it and was surprised to find there was a horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a chemical smell. Noxious and unpleasant, like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast, and blood and entrails were pooling around the far side. What the hell could do such a thing? I thought to myself. Aren't bears at the top of the food chain? Alpha predators? Gibson was by my side, but she did not venture near the body. Usually she would be curious about something like this, trying to sniff at it, but instead she stayed back, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There was no way out. Not unless I could move the body of a giant bear. No matter which way I attempted it, it would not budge. It weighed a ton, literally. There were large trees on either side of the road, no way to get past. There was only one other way out, which was by driving across the frozen lake, and that was risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable. There was a clear way on and off the ice if it came down to it, though. I got back in the truck and threw it in reverse since there was nowhere to turn around. I felt sick to my stomach, nervous with anticipation and fear, uncertain of how I was going to get out of here. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of my truck and went down to the ice with my spud. Walking out onto the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig with the sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I'd found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure, my heart sank. The ice was barely seven inches thick. Just below the minimum eight inches, where it would be safe to drive a vehicle across. And my truck was on the heavier side, I would feel more comfortable if it was a full th foot thick or more. I pulled out my phone and checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Who I would call, I still wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. Of course, I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bar was down to zero, and the words, no service, were printed across the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe weather alert by now, I realized, had it not been for the total lack of cell signal. Because snow was now being dumped down on me from above and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience that it would go through eventually, and I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine. Her tone rose in volume and she began to bark. High, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. 
She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what her eyes had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk too high up, the nails too long, too sharp to be a person's. Whatever this giant was, it looked similar to a man, but it was massive. It peered out at me from between the boughs of trees, its head probably 15 feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it, a gray, pale white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I could make out its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the gray light coming through the clouds. And then I saw its mouth spread even wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and it disappeared back into the darkness. The temperature felt like it had dropped to 30 below freezing again. As I began to shiver involuntarily and looked down to see Gibson was doing the same. There was only one choice. Only one place we could go. The cabin. It was either that or risk the truck plunging into a frozen lake, attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula surrounded by water on all sides with only one way in or out and that way was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest? I asked myself over and over again, but no answer came to mind. There was no creature I could think of that was 15 feet tall with reflective eyes which stood on two legs like a man, capable of disemboweling a full-grown bear, capable of causing the temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that, and it wasn't supposed to exist. It was something from myth and from folklore, from legends that aren't supposed to be real. It's a wendigo. I said aloud, immediately regretting the words as if saying them made it true, as if saying them would summon it. Wendigos are supernatural creatures, born of Canadian First Nations folklore. They live in cold, remote places and make people go mad merely through their presence. They thrive on the hunger, despair, and loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities. They drive families apart, instilling urges of cannibalism in people and making them want to consume their own loved ones during the lean, hard months of winter. They turn people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones. And then, once you're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing the flesh from your bones while you beg and scream, or it turns you into one of its own kind. But the Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller and more emaciated. Its hunger grows more insatiable with its height, until it is a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops, as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gibson whimpered and burrowed her face into my armpit as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stoked her fur and told her it would be okay, although I had a feeling it wouldn't be. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it knowing we might be stuck there for a while. Pretty soon the wind was howling and blowing outside, and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of keeping it open, every so often and clearing the steps, knowing that I would need firewood, taking weary glances off in the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally, I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove, which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp, but I kept 
feeding fresh kindling into it, nursing it until it kept going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling and the sun was beginning to set again. My stomach was rumbling with hunger when I felt something strange. The ground was suddenly shaking beneath my feet and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it, girl? I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer, and I imagined the huge creature lifting the roof from the cabin like the cloche on our dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up and eating me whole like a wriggling shrimp. A second later there was a sound at the front door of metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash, and then the wooden door was being torn from its hinges an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I could hear the thing tearing apart the front entrance, easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use it as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon I could find nearby, thinking I would throw it at the thing's face to defend us. When I heard a strange noise coming from out front. It was a car horn honking. Someone had come to save us. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat message, indicating at some point it had gone through and at some brief moment there had been a gap in the clouds. Reading the one new message received on my phone, a hopeful smile spread across my face. Matt, you just had to skip town a day early and go ice fishing, didn't you? What the hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay, are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside, which I realized had come from the monster. They had actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked up, seeing the creature for the first time, clearly. It stood with its back to us its head among the treetops even taller than it had appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now was fully aware of them, and it was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage, and I realized one of my friends had gotten out of the car and they were using themselves as bait, so that the two of us could flee the cottage safely. They had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guess that they'd also run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear which had blocked the road. Jay! Ted screamed out the window, driving the car in circles on the ice as if too terrified to stay still. I raced over to the car, slipping and sliding on the lake ice. It was Matt who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large and too fast, and he didn't know what he was dealing with. But that was Matt. He was always the act first, think later type. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look and gave me a quick thumbs up, his attention diverted from the creature for a split second too long. As Gibson and I got back into the car, I heard his screams, and I looked to see the Wendigo had closed the distance in an instant and was picking him up like an insect, turning him and taking bites from him in places. As Matt screamed for help, the creature began to peel off his skin, exposing his shining skull as he ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles, and then wet, choked sounds as I got out of the car and went to run after him. But Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. You can't save him, he said with wet, red-rimmed eyes, and eventually I relented. We raced away across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath out of the fresh fallen snow on our way back to the main roads. For a while, we debated what to do. Should we call the police? Our friend had just died, after all. But we knew that if we did, we would be considered suspects. 
with no other reasonable explanation that would probably pin the death on us. They would say we killed him. There was no box you could check on an official police report citing a Wendigo attack, after all. They would think we were crazy. Those things didn't exist. They were myths. Legends. But, as it turned out, we wouldn't have to worry about it. A message pop up on my phone from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home. And I had to tell myself it wasn't all just a nightmare. A hallucination from the cold, from lack of sleep and food. But Greg and Ted both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real. As much as I wish it wasn't. The three of us read the message on the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast and a sick knot was growing my stomach. Bile rising in my throat that I could taste in my mouth. Matt. Hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard, if not more. Let's reschedule the trip for next weekend, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we don't want to go, we've resolved that we have to. We can't leave Matt like that. We have to help him. So next weekend, we're making the trip back up there. Even if it kills us. I was ten years old when it happened. I was playing in the backyard with my Tonka truck, alone with my thoughts, as I had done many times before. I was shy, so the neighborhood kids didn't like me too much, and I rarely played sports, which only made things worse. Fortunately, my backyard was connected to a small forest, which provided plenty of diversion for me and my burgeoning imagination. The grass was moist from the morning's rainfall. The lawn was mucky and gross. Needless to say, I was covered head to toe in dirt. As I vroomed my truck along the rim of the yard, digging up dirt and rocks and worms. I inched along the sodden soil on shabby knees, truck in hand, heading towards my favorite tree. This tree... A wondrous red oak stood at the edge of the forest. My father had built a ladder going up it so I could climb it real high. I liked that. Sometimes I would read books up there until it got dark. This particular afternoon, however, I didn't feel like climbing. I was having fun gathering acorns and mixing them with mud and stones, pretending to build a house. Then I heard a voice. Freddy, the voice whispered. I looked up, startled. No one was around, so I continued playing. Psst, Freddy, over here. Again, I looked around. Nothing. Although my heart was racing. I was too young to worry. That would come later. Instead, I shrugged and returned to play. Then my Tonka truck started driving itself. It steered around the base of the red oak, stopping at the other side of the tree. The side that was off the beaten path. Ah, heck, I scolded as I crawled to the other side of the tree. I was already filthy. What was more dirt going to do? Mom makes me wash up before dinner anyways. The truck beeped as if telling me to hurry up. By now, I'd forgotten about the anonymous voice. I fumbled through the foliage, cursing the fallen acorns as they dug into my knees. The truck was parked at the base of the tree, its big black tires clinging to the bark like insects. The tree towered high above me, its branches like arms flexing its might. I looked up and felt nauseous. The voice came back. Hey, kid. 
fear started creeping in. I should go home now, I told myself matter-of-factly. A heavy gust of wind rustled through my hair. The tree trembled. Nah, the voice replied, sounding like a bad guy on TV. You should stay here, with me. My truck started flapping its dump bed, as if to agree. That's when I noticed the face on the tree, staring back at me. It's more fun here, the tree said. You wait and see. The truck blew its horn, then disappeared into the face of the tree. Anger came quickly. I wanted my truck back. It was a gift from my grandmother. Give me back my truck, I pouted. The tree huffed and puffed. Come on, kid. Aren't you the least bit curious? I was. Then come inside. Have a look. You'll love it in here, I promise. The tree was trying to sound pleasant, which only made it worse. I shook my head and crossed my arms. The tree chortled. Its droopy red eyes were completely insane. My ten-year-old self was both terrified and intrigued. I'd never heard of a talking tree before. This can't be real, I said to myself. For a moment, nothing happened. The tree blinked automatically, then it waited. Finally, against my better judgment, I stuck my head inside its elongated mouth, just for a peek. The tree swallowed me whole. I felt a whoosh, and then everything went gray. When I stepped out, the forest seemed different. The trees loomed larger than life. The air is fresh as a morning sunrise. Welcome to the forest. A sparrow sung sweetly, then disappeared into the glow of the honeycomb sun. A red-tailed hawk stopped on a nearby branch. I'm the biggest bird in this here forest, it boasted. Its voice sounded like a chainsaw. I was dumbfounded, and I'd forgotten about my truck. Attaboy, the tree said, scaring me out of my mental slumber. I jumped to my feet with furious fists. I was mad as hell. But also I was intrigued. Everything around me was bursting with brilliance. The sky was the deepest blue I'd ever seen. The grass as green as a crisp dollar bill. Welcome to the Forever Forest! The tree said, grinning ear to ear. It reached out a branch and shook my hand. You'll love it here, Freddy, I promise. Words failed me, I was stupefied. My mind was fighting sensory overload. I pinched myself to see if I was dreaming. I wasn't. Something ran over my foot. I leapt ten feet in the air. My faithful Tonka was scooting around in the tall grass, tooting its tiny horn. What is this place? I heard myself ask. The red oak rustled its branches. I told you already, the tree said. You're in the forever forest. I took a tentative step backwards and rubbed my eyes. My truck beeped. A flock of birds were pecking at it, stealing bits from its dump box. The truck raced down the steep incline, letting the birds eat dust. Hey, come back, I shouted. My voice ricocheted off the trees. The sound lasted for hours. By now, all eyes were aimed at me, waiting. My heart was pounding through my Spider-Man t-shirt. It was caked in filth. The red-tailed hawk soared overhead. It scooped up my truck, and before I could protest, it dropped it to my feet. There you go, kid, the hawk said. I looked at the toy truck with scorn. Toot toot, said the truck. Without warning, sadness swept over me. 
I longed for home. Nothing here seemed real, yet somehow I knew it was. I had discovered a secret place, the land of the forgotten, a parallel universe, perhaps. Even at my tender age, I knew this meant trouble. Yes, the birds and the trees seemed pleasant, but something in their eyes told me otherwise. They wanted to keep me here. Forever. I want to go home. I put my foot down as I said this. Thunder crashed in the distance. The tree rattled in rage. I'm afraid that's impossible, it said. Nobody ever leaves the forever forest. At this moment, the limitations of my age become unbearable. I yearn for an adult to come rescue me. Uh, uh, I protested. The tree shook violently, the ground quivered. I shot off like a firecracker, screaming down the slope until my feet became tangled and I tripped. Consequently, I rolled down the hill like a bumbling avalanche. When I reached the bottom, both my arms and legs were riddled with scrapes and bruises. I dropped to my knees and bawled my eyes out. I don't remember being sadder and more scared in my life. My tears formed a river which flowed freely through the forest, reaching as far as my watering eyes could see. It was the onset of nightfall that sobered me up. The sun was sinking like a stone. The moon hung overhead, big and round and full. Apparently time in this world was different. Then my tummy tossed and turned. I was famished. Just then an apple rolled down the hill, stopping at my feet. It was as red as a fire truck, plump as Thanksgiving dinner. I picked it up, dusted it off, and took a bite. It was delicious. By far the juiciest apple ever to grace my lips. I ate greedily. Lightning flashed overhead, casting sinister shadows all around me. Thunder roared its wrongful wrath. I became grossly self-conscious, feeling the gaze of the trees standing over me. I didn't belong here. This much was obvious. I scanned the vicinity. The forest was endless. I was too scared to venture any deeper, so I hurried back up the hill, looking for the face in the tree. Surely, if I asked nicely, it would let me leave. When I reached the top of the hill, the tree chortled. Back so soon, Freddy boy! The neighboring trees snickered. I was about to reply when I felt a drop of rain, followed by another. Suddenly the world went dark. Rain fell like missiles, soaking me head to toe. I sulked. The tree scoffed. Just a little rain, Freddy boy. You're not scared of rain, are ya? I shivered. My translucent skin succumbed to the wetness of my grimy clothes. I felt miserable. Without a second thought, I ventured to the front of the tree. Fortunately, Daddy's steps were still nailed into its bark. I climbed up, stopping under a thick branch which provided some much-needed shelter. I want to go home, I said, shaking in my shoes. You are home, the tree replied. Isn't that right? Of course, the surrounding trees responded in a chorus of agreement. But just remember, kid, the tree interrupted. Do not listen to the snake. This is snake? What snake? The forest erupted with laughter. Every animal, big and small, joined in. And with that, the forever forest fell under a blanket of silence. Subtle snoring wafted through the thicket of trees like a lonesome lullaby. I never wanted to be home as badly as I did at that moment. 
My mind meandered to my parents. Every terrible thing I'd said to them came flooding back like a bad dream. Would they even miss me? The other kids in the neighborhood surely wouldn't. Nobody liked me. Maybe I was better off in the forever forest. Maybe I could finally make some real friends. Friends who liked me. Once again I wept. Then I curled up in between two strong branches and drifted off into a restless sleep. Something slithered across me and I woke in a flash. My screams were a tidal wave of displeasure. The tree cursed then returned to its peaceful slumber. Hello, Frederick. A slithery voice spoke. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust. Don't be alarmed, said the snake. I'm your friend. Your best friend. The six-foot rattlesnake was weaving its way across my arms and legs. Its skin felt like sandpaper. I froze. My fear of snakes was merciless. There was nowhere to go but down. The fall would hurt, but would not be lethal. At least not in the normal world. I want to go home, I said, embarrassed by my grief-stricken voice. Well, said the snake, staring deep into my eyes. Maybe I can help you with that. It slithered up my body, stopping directly in front of my face. The smell of soggy reptile skin seeped into my nostrils and stayed there. You can? I stuttered. Of course! The snake bragged. Its eyes sparkled as it spoke. I'm the ruler of these here parts. You are? Then do it, please. That will depend on what you're willing to do for me. Yes. Uh, there's always a catch. Even as a child, I knew this to be true. Uh, what do you want from me? The snake hissed. When its forked tongue fondled my nose, my bladder almost gave out. Well, it spoke surreptitiously. Let's see what we've got to work with. The snake, now inches from my eyes, was penetrating my mind. I could feel it rattling around, rummaging through my memories. Ah, yes, it said after an uncomfortable length of time. You'll do just fine. By now I'm as scared as I've ever been. My arms and legs were cramped, and if I didn't relieve my bladder, I'd explode. A scurry of squirrels had gathered at the trunk of the tree, cautiously looking up. The snake backed off a bit. Its dour face produced what I imagined to be a smile. Let me introduce myself, said the snake. The name's Salvador. My folks around here call me Spook. Spook spoke with an air of royalty. This was no ordinary snake. Heck, this was no ordinary forest. He slid up an adjacent branch and wrapped himself around it, never taking his eyes off of mine. Without hesitation, I climbed down the tree, found some bushes, and peed. It felt like heaven. Spook laughed. Well done, kid. Well done. When I finished, I was surprised to see Spook slinking around my ankles. Now, he said in a more serious tone. Let's get down to business, shall we? We did. Spook talked. He had plenty to say. Spook promised to bring me back to my world. No questions asked. But only if I made him famous. I chuckled at the thought, thinking I was getting off easy. There would be consequences, Spook warned. But he assured me they'd be minute. And for my troubles, he added with a wisp, 
and have all the earthly pleasures at my disposal. I agreed. Excellent, said the snake. He led me back to the talking tree, where I was surprised by a handwritten contract waiting in the exposed roots. I'd never seen such fancy script before. The paper seemed ancient, like from medieval times, and looked to be made of animal skin. Beside the contract was a fountain pen. I dipped the pen into the bottle of ink next to it. Sign on the dotted line, said the snake. Then you can return to your home. But I shall become famous. I didn't trust the sound of his voice nor the look in his beady black eyes. But what choice did I have? I signed the parchment. The snake smiled. I'll see you in your dreams, kid. Small circles swirled inside Spook's eyes, hypnotizing me. I became disoriented. Then everything went dark. I woke next to the tree, squint-eyed and confused. I stood up abruptly and fell over. I had tripped over my Tonka truck. Toot toot, said the truck. Fear filled me fast. Was I still in the forever forest? Good God, I hope not. Up ahead was the edge of the tree line, leading to my backyard. I ran full steam ahead, forgetting my truck. There was a commotion coming from inside my house. Something had happened. Something bad. Before I knew it, my grandmother was embracing me. She was weeping. My mind was filled with dread. Something was wrong, terribly wrong. What had I done? My grandmother said four words that would forever change the course of my life. Your parents are dead. As it turned out, I'd only been gone for a few hours, during which time my parents slipped away to pick up groceries for dinner, while my grandmother waited at home. My parents never returned. How could they? On their way back from the grocery store, they were sideswiped by a transport truck, killing them instantly. The rest of that summer was a blur. I stayed with my grandmother, who later adopted me. The feeling that I was somehow responsible for my parents' death was impossible to ignore. My grief helped me forget the forever forest. I must have fallen asleep beside the tree and dreamed the entire episode. Slowly, over time, I convinced myself of this. All I wanted was my parents to return. They never did, of course. They were dead. The following school year, my class was assigned to write a story. The best story would be printed in the local newspaper. I dove into this project as though my life depended on it. Since the passing of my parents, my classmates resented me even more. Their teasing was relentless. I'd become the orphan boy. The story was all I had. The story wrote itself. I called it The Adventures of Forever Forest. In it, I included a talking snake named Spook, who ruled over the forest, and our hero, Chester, a toy truck, who protected the forest creatures from Spook and his inevitable wrath. The story won first prize, and to my amazement was published by several prominent magazines across America. Agents from across the country were beating down my door. Next thing I know, I'm on the news and Spook is famous. I was 11 years old. This was all new to me. The Forever Forest was included in a popular video game. Cha-ching. My post-secondary was now paid for. My grandmother was over the moon with pride. My good fortune continued. By the time I finished high school, I was the number one selling author of creepy children's books. Turns out the world couldn't get enough of the forever forest. 
Millions of children worldwide fell in love with Spook and his slithering setbacks. Chester's adventures were contagious. Twelve books later, including several Pixar adaptations, I'm rich beyond my wildest dreams. Who knew? And that's how I became America's cherished children's author. My beautiful wife, Isabel, adored me wholeheartedly. Her love never wavered. She was my rock, my soulmate, my reason for living. And life was grand. At least for a while. Which leads me to the reason why I'm writing this story in the first place. Something happened to me that curious afternoon, that day I signed my life away to a talking snake in a lively forest. Something peculiar. Not only did I lose both my parents, the two people who truly loved me, I've aged. I look and feel twice my age on a good day, which is why I rarely do interviews. Fortunately, my success has awarded me the luxury of shunning myself from the rest of the world. I'm an author. It's to be expected. The reason I was able to scribble down so many stories in such a short amount of time is because Spook would narrate them to me in my sleep. Every so often, he'd pay me a visit, and I'd wake up with fresh ideas. All I had to do was jot them down. Which I did, to the praise of millions of readers. Recently, however, Spook stopped visiting me. Thus, the stories are drying up. To make matters worse, my wonderful wife passed away. Cancer came fast and hard. She didn't have a chance. Soon I'll be seeing her. My dreams tell me this. In fact, I'll be gone by the time many of you read this. Even typing these words is a chore. My hands ache, my bones creak. I'm as blind as a bad idea. My Tonka arrived this morning. I hadn't seen that silly yellow truck since that fateful day in the woods. And this is the sign I've been waiting for. Today I shall return to the forever forest. It's still there, I can assure you. Only this time I'll be staying. My time has come. Thank you, forever reader. For all you've given me. I've lived a king's life and I owe it all to you. Well, you and a talking serpent who goes by the name Spook. Unless we forget Chester and the talking tree and all the other creatures in the lesser-known land I discovered long ago. Yes, I'm heading back to the source of all the magic. The one place I truly belong. The Forever Forest. Tonight's story was written by Marcus Starr. Marcus is a very talented author who uh, also posts on Reddit No Sleep under the uh, username Call Me Star with two R's. So uh, you can check out his work on Reddit. He's also got a book available on Amazon called Nora's Curse, which is uh, an excellent book. I've had a chance to read it, and I highly recommend uh, checking out his book. If you'd like to support his work and uh, support him as an author, I'll include a link in the description below, and I encourage you all to, to check it out. Thanks for listening to the story today, everyone, and uh, please join me again. I post every other day at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, thanks. Please like, subscribe, comment. It really helps out the channel when you guys do that. And I'll see you again next time. Have a great night. This madness all happened about 20 years ago. I've never talked about it. No one else would believe it. I don't blame you if you don't either. Sure, I wouldn't. My brother Steve and I had gotten permission from our parents to fly out to British Columbia by ourselves to see our cousin Denise and my Aunt Victoria. My brother was 18, I was 15. We were out on the west coast visiting with them and they suggested we could go out to spend the night with a friend of theirs named Blake. He lived in a float house, my cousin Denise said to us. 
their friend was a retired professional chef and maintained a peaceful existence far away from any civilization. His floating cabin was anchored in a bay which sheltered his abode from the harsh weather and waves of the Pacific Ocean. The place was accessible only by prop plane or by boat. It took us hours to get out there, but the area was idyllic and breathtaking in its beauty, so the trip there was certainly not boring. Vast wilderness as far as the eye could see, blue oceans and mountains on the horizon. The weather was warm but rainy, despite the fact that it was late winter. There was rarely snow in that part of the province, as we were used to back home. On our trip out to the floating house, we stayed near land for safety in our small vessel. It also afforded a few looks at some of the sights along the way. Giant, towering waterfalls, huge cliffs, as well as wildlife of all sorts. Orca whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions were spotted along the way. At one point, we saw an eagle in the water up ahead. My cousin Denise was up front, and her husband Jack was driving the boat inside his little glass hut near the back. She waved for him to slow down as we approached the huge dinosaur bird swimming in the water. It looked injured, we thought at first. My cousin tried to reach out to it with a pole to help it up into the boat, but she just scared it off and it flew away. We realized the giant bird wasn't injured at all. It was carrying a fish in its talons. The bloated carcass of the thing bobbed to the surface, and my cousin pulled it up from the water as the bald eagle watched enviously from its perch on a tree nearby. The strange fish was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was an odd shade of purple, and was clearly dead. There was a hole in its middle from where the bird had impaled it with its talons, using its giant clawed feet to drag the thing up to shore. Jack came up front to look at the fish. Hmm, never seen one like that before. Looks like a bottom feeder. I wonder how that eagle managed to grab it. He told us to leave it where it was and got back behind the wheel. He drove closer to the shore and came back to the front of the boat. He heaved the fish onto the shore and we watched as the bald eagle swooped down from its high tree branch to feast on it. It pulled the flesh from the thing in large strips, gulping them down greedily. It would have felt bad if we scared him off from his breakfast. Jack said, going back into his glass hut where the steering wheel was kept. The boat started moving again, and we watched the trees go by as the never-ending forest continued to pass on our left. Finally, we reached the small bay where the float house was located. The quiet inlet was the perfect spot for a solitary life. My cousin's friend Blake greeted us with a big smile when we pulled up, throwing out ropes for us to tie off with. It appeared he hadn't seen any other people for a long time and he was jovial and talkative for long stretches. Bonjour! He tied up the ropes quickly with expert precision and held out a hand for my cousin Denise. She climbed off the boat and they embraced warmly. Les amis, et la prochaine, bienvenue dans la maison flottante de Blake. Hello friends and loved ones, welcome to the floating house of Blake. I figured it was something like that based on what I remembered from my nine years of mandatory French class courtesy of the Canadian school system. Ah, you must be the cousins, he said to us, extending a hand when we were safely off the boat. Welcome to my humble abode. He shook his hand and smiled back at him. Thankful he was speaking English now. My brain was fuzzy enough from jet lag without having to translate with my D-plus grade 9 French class education. Ah, thanks for having us. This place is amazing. I can't believe you live out here, I said. I'm just lucky... He said, Some people couldn't do it, since it can be a little lonely sometimes, but personally, I love it. He took us for a tour of his little house. It took about a minute. A bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom that we weren't supposed to use. My cousin's husband told me if I had to go just to hang my butt off the side and let her rip into the ocean. Just make sure someone's watching in case you fall in. Blake was more excited to take us for a tour of the bay and the surrounding area. He had prawn traps placed nearby, and there were oysters galore wherever he looked. You could cast out a fishing line anywhere and catch a cod. For someone like me who enjoyed the outdoors and loved to fish, 
This was paradise. The bay was just as inviting for aquatic life as it was for humans, it seemed. The quiet waters made for excellent fishing. We pulled up a giant cod that was about three feet long without even trying that hard. And that was after grabbing dozens of oysters and hundreds of prawns in less than an hour with barely any effort. Blake set the traps back for the next day and said we would be having an all-you-can-eat buffet of them for as long as we stayed. It was exciting to help pull up the prawn traps, seeing their beady red eyes as hundreds of them squirmed in the traps. It made me hungry just looking at them. You can eat them raw, you know, Blake said, grabbing one and biting it in half. They taste sweet. He handed me one and I followed suit. They did taste sweet, I thought to myself. And a little salty, of course. Dinner will be in a few minutes, Blake said from the kitchen. It was a couple hours after we'd gotten back from pulling up prawn traps. He was preparing a feast, which would prove to be very tasty. Fresh prawns sautéed in garlic, scallops and clam served with rice were all on the menu. There were also vegetables, but I won't bore you with the details of those. The aroma was mouth-watering. That smells amazing, I said to him. Can't wait to try whatever you have bacon in the oven. What's this Rockefeller? He called back from the kitchen. I never heard of it, but I was in for whatever the hell that was. I watched as he pulled a steaming baking tray from the oven. The smell of melted cheese and toasted breadcrumbs wafted over, making me salivate even more. What are we going to do with that cod? My cousin Denise asked. Doesn't seem like we need it for dinner, Blake said. I was thinking we could use it to try to catch an even bigger one tomorrow. Bigger than that one? I exclaimed. How big do these things get? About five feet? Some of the biggest ones I've seen? Blake said. I couldn't believe that something so big could be used as bait. But whatever was going to consume that creature had to be massive. I really wanted to see if it worked. Can we go out after dinner? I asked, excitedly. I'd been fishing in freshwater lakes and rivers for most of my life, and this was something new and different. I was amazed at the variety of ocean life and how this man was living happily from its bounty. Yeah, we can do that, he said with a smile, happy to oblige. I really wish Blake had said no, though. I wish he'd said not tonight, looking back. But he agreed. And with that, our lives would be changed forever. We climbed into the boat as the sun was beginning to set on the horizon. Blake had a big spotlight up front and said that we would need to be extra careful to watch out for deadheads. If you don't know, those are branches and logs that poke out from the water and can damage the boat when you're too close. They're easy to spot in broad daylight, but at night you can figure out pretty quickly how they got their name. If you're speeding along in a motorboat and you clip a big deadhead, you're not going to be looking very pretty after that. I promised to keep a lookout and we left the float house, looking for deeper waters. The water was cast in an orange glow, and I remember what Jack had said to us that morning as the sun came up. It was a strange Martian red as we were leaving the docks. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. I guess we better look out for trouble today, everyone, he had said, chuckling. But it was still an unsettling omen. The setting sun grew dimmer as we made our way into deeper waters. We finally stopped in a seemingly random place that Blake told us had excellent fishing. We cast out our lines and bobbed the rods dutifully up and down as he had instructed us to earlier. We sat out there for an hour, with hardly a nibble. The sky went black as the moonless night began to glitter with a trillion stars. Then suddenly my line bent at an insane angle and I felt myself being pulled across the steel floor of the boat. It all happened in an instant and before I knew what was happening I was flying off the side of the vessel and into the pitch black water of the ocean. My instinct had been to hold on to the fishing rod, thinking it had been a large cod or some other creature taking the bait, but my iron clad grip on the handle seemed to tighten reflexively as I tumbled into the water. It was only when I felt the icy cold ocean on my skin that I let go, realizing how stupid I was for hanging on as long as I had. Part of me had been worried about losing the expensive fishing rod, but still, looking back, it was really idiotic. 
I kicked and thrashed in the cold water, my body nearly going into shock. Denise and Steve helped me up, and Blake ran over to help. Just as I was about to clamber over the railing and back into the boat, something grabbed onto my leg. It felt like it was an enormous hand made of mud. I looked back and saw a form was floating on the surface of the water. It was an amorphous blob that made itself into a more human form before my eyes. It clung on to my leg as it floated unnaturally in the water below me, and it felt like my foot was caught in quicksand. I screamed in terror and revulsion, kicking at the thing with my other leg, and my other foot sunk into its neck and I felt myself being pulled into it. The thing made a sound like mud sucking out your shoes as you walk through it, over and over with greedy abandon pulling me into itself. I saw it was smiling, rows and rows of sharp teeth glistening in the moonlight. Its tongue poked out and licked my leg, and I saw it began to hiss and steam as if acid had just been dropped onto it. I cried out in pain and fear as I grabbed onto my cousin and my brother. Blake grabbed me by my belt and heaved as hard as he could trying to separate me from the thing. All the while I looked into its eyes and saw they were yellow and full of hate and hunger. It made a deep growling noise from deep within itself when it saw me looking in its eyes. Suddenly its sharp toothed mouth opened like a shark and it looked like it was going to take a bite out of me. That was when I heard the sound of a flare gun blast. I saw a sizzling firecracker burrowing a hole in the side of the thing's head, and Jack stood triumphantly on the deck of the boat with an orange flare gun in his hand. He ran over to help pull me in a second later as the thing began to loosen its grip. It wailed and writhed in pain. The feeling of being trapped in quicksand began to abate. Finally, they pulled me over the side into the boat. I breathed deep, gasping breaths and looked around in wild-eyed terror. Where had the thing gone? And then I saw it. Standing behind Jack. It was like it had swam beneath the boat in an instant and clambered up the other side of the boat without the least bit of effort. Jack didn't notice it, of course. He was trembling, saying something about how he had never seen anything like that in his life. And it was lucky he had the flare gun handy. Then he noticed our widening eyes and looks of petrified horror. He turned around and I saw water pooling around his feet a second later as his bladder released. The thing stood twelve feet tall, at least, and as wide as a bear. It towered over him and picked him up with its huge arms. The creature appeared to be made of pitch-black mud, but it had a vaguely humanoid shape. It ripped his arms off first, then pulled off his head, cutting off his screams. The thing separated his legs from his body next and dropped them to the floor of the boat. It started with his head eating it first and licking its bright red lips happily afterwards. The yellow-eyed creature picked up each part of him and swallowed Jack in great, big bites until there was nothing left of him. The black mud thing let out a loud and satisfied belch before smiling at us broadly again. And then it was gone as fast as it appeared, slipping off the side of the boat effortlessly, tipping the boat in that direction only slightly as it went as if it was much lighter than it looked. We stood on the deck of the boat and looked at the chunks of hair and bits of bone, teeth and scraps of clothing that had belonged to our companion just a few moments before. My cousin Denise wept and banged her fists on the edge of the boat. We grabbed her and pulled her back as she almost dove into the water after the creature. She bawled and wailed, cursing and screaming at the thing. Blake drove us back to the float house after a few minutes of silent shock. We cleaned the boat and called in a report of a man overboard, giving the approximate location of where Jack had gone missing. But we knew nothing would ever be found when the police did their investigation. People fall into the ocean all the time, and many are never found, so the cops didn't give us too much trouble. The water had been cold that night and Jack was not a good swimmer. We went back home a few days later. My brother and I were never the same after that. We had seen something that was unexplainable and irrational, 
And now we had no idea what else was really possible. I've never gone back to British Columbia. I can't go fishing anymore either. I used to love fishing. But the worst part is when it rains. When the ground turns soft and muddy. I can't go outdoors at all until it's dry again. I begin to panic if I get caught in a storm and have to walk through the muck. And if I feel it pulling at my shoes, grabbing me, and trying to take me down and into it. The worst part is I can't help but look. And he's always there looking right back. A smiling face with yellow eyes and too many teeth. Staring back at me hungry, ravenous, and never satisfied.